Welcome to the uh, second day of our uh, clinical biomarkers workshop. Uh, as a matter of a short introduction into the material that will be taught today, um, I'm just going to say that this is the second uh, course that I'm teaching and the material keeps in evolving. So um, uh, in the end of the course, um, you will be prompted to give your feedback, and I would uh, much appreciate your feedback on, uh, on, on my day in terms of the uh, content, um, depth, and uh, level of, and, and the breadth of spectrum of topics uh, in lectures and uh, the structure of a lab, which is going to be a bit different from yesterday. So, um, So uh, the module three would be uh, called clinical omics, and it will it will be uh, uh, composed of two parts. In the first part, I will talk um, uh, about the. So this is basically um, a bit of extension of the topics that were covered yesterday by SORAP, and I will talk a bit about the transcriptome profiling using both microarrays and next-gen sequencing technologies. Quite briefly, uh, there is a next-gen um, sequencing uh, workshop here that you can take. Uh, so I will just give you a, a very short, short um, very um, small glimpse at the situation um, uh, at this front. And then I will uh, illustrate the application of these technologies to the profiling of alternative splicing in um, cancer. Uh, so this will be a part one. And um, after the short break um, between the two parts, uh, we will follow with a part two where I will introduce you to the uh, clinical omics basics. Um, and then, um, we will talk about um, the procedures of building classifiers and the classification discrimination problems in the biomarker discovery. And I will illustrate the application of these approaches to the um, drug response studies. So now let's start with the first part. Uh, now the transcriptome profiling using uh, high resolution technologies. So, as you've, as you've seen yesterday, and, and as you um, probably knew before pretty well, there is a um, vast number of different statistical methods that have been um, uh, developed out there by the research community for the analysis of microarrays. And for instance, this uh, paper um, is devoted to the evaluation of different statistical methods um, using cDNA microarray um, technology, and it was published in 2000. So now, um, for the next-gen sequencing technology, um, what people have been mostly doing for the last few years is they've been trying to work out the profiling of any given sample and to uh, come up with an appropriate methods of um, measuring copy number or expression using next-gen sequencing technology. And now that they have succeeded with this, uh, now we are posed with the um, question, how are we going to analyze a cohort of samples uh, profiled with next-gen sequencing technology? And now it's becoming clear that we can basically apply the same statistical methods uh, as in microarrays to the next-gen sequencing uh, profiles. And this is a paper which is actually by the same authors, but now in 2010, this is a very recent paper, uh, where they evaluated um, pretty much the same statistical methods for analysis of differential expression from next-gen sequencing profiling. So just to remind you, um, um, the, um, the conventional steps that are usually taken um, during the microarray uh, profiling of expression, say, um, uh, so uh, there are a number of steps. Um, so you have your fabricated array with physical DNA sequences printed on it, and then you have your sample material which you hybridize onto that array 
and then you get a series of images, uh, scans of those arrays. And so you go usually through uh, three major steps of background correction, which allows you to tell real signal from background noise. Then normalization is the next step, uh, the goal of which is to make the expression uh, profiles comparable across chips or across samples. And in the end, you do a summarization, um, such as axon level expression summary or gene level expression summary. It just depends on on the um, on the array design and your study design. And in the end, sorry, it's not really clearly seen there. In the end, you get a log two expression measurements for your microarray platform. Now, how do we get from the next gen sequencing to the expression profiles? So the idea is very simple. First, um, say we have a gene model like that, which includes a number of axons. This may be an alternative axon, which may be excluded or included. And then you may have a transcript like that, for simplicity. I just put just one transcript structure here, isoform. And so these two things are known a priori from the gene annotation databases. Then you take a collection of uh, RNA seq reads and you map them onto your transcript sequences. And then you cover both exonic regions and junction regions. And so uh, by quantifying the number of reads that are mapped to this particular sequence of a transcript isoform, um, so this quantification of reads gives you a measure of expression. So basically the idea, more reads in a sample library, the high expression. But now, is it really true that more reads are higher expression? And the answer is no. There is a number of considerations in the RNA-seq data that are always have to be kept in mind. So for instance, longer genes, more reads naturally, right? The longer sequence, the more reads you can map to those longer sequences. Does it mean high expression? The answer is no, not necessarily. Then the greater sequencing depth, the more million reads you get out of your sample library, the more reads you get mapped to the same um, sequence. Uh, is it an indication of a high expression? Not necessarily. And then um, certainly in comparison with other libraries, with other samples. Now, there can be a situation that when you have more map reads to a given region for some reason that are, that are not explained by these two um, other points. And these can be possibly non-unique regions. Is it necessarily high expression? And this is considering that you have um, masked the repeats in the genome, and yet you get a higher density of your reads across certain regions. So is it a high expression? No, not necessarily. This can be a certain uh, region that um, has some other regions in the genome with high similarity. And so you have to correct for that too. And there may be some other, yes? How would you, just I mean, very briefly, how would you, sort of, would you correct for each one of these? Like for okay. Genes, would you take so for the gene length into yes. account for yes. expression? Yes, yes. So, the, um, so basically there are certain metrics that have been introduced a couple of years ago, uh, specifically by Barbara Wald Group. Um, um, and that metric is called the RPKM. I'll briefly mention that. So basically you normalize by the length of the sequence that you're mapping to. So this is a correction that is usually done these days. And yet, with the Illumina platform, for instance, um, there is a propensity for a longer and higher expressed genes to be preferentially sequenced. And this is recognized to be a big problem and uh, people are trying to develop certain algorithms to correct, to fix this bias. Now, greater sequencing depth, uh, the same metric such as RPKM, which is the, the simplest one and probably one of the first um, metrics uh, that was available out there, does take into account the sequencing depth. And so the RPKM means the read counts per kilobase of axon per million reads. So if you have libraries that sequence at dip and different depths, say 10 millions in one and 20 millions in another, so you just normalize by the total number of reads 
that are read from that library, and you get this kind of normalization. Uh, now, more map reads to a given region. <coughs> so, there is a um, notion um, um, which is which uh, which is called a mappability of each and every nucleotide in the human genome, and that means if you take any given nucleotide, how uh, how possible is it that if say fictimer from RNA seq that spans this particular nucleotide would be mapped to more than one location in the genome. So not only to this one, but to some other locations within the genome. And this assessment is done for each and every nucleotide in the human genome. And so each nucleotide has a mappability score that you can use to correct for these things. So presumably that mappability score depends on the size of the oligo that you're... Yes, and it's very order. much, pretty much, uh, you know, library-specific or platform-specific, right? So um, in the in the previous generation, we had 30, 36 MERS, right? So the, um, the construction of a mappability, the production of mappability score across the genome would um, include um, taking 36 MERS. Now we have 50 MERS, so you still need to reproduce the whole procedure and get new mappability scores. And next step is 75 MERS, and that will need to be repeated. But basically, if you, if there, there's a number of uh, approaches um, that are taken by different groups and um, to compute mappability scores for human genome. And you can go to the UCC browser, and you can browse the mappability track, and you'll see a number of um, of, of different mappability scores. And do those scores yet take into account what's known about copy number variation or not yet? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think they should. Because yeah, obviously eventually they will, but... I think they should because the entire procedure basically um, is that you take all 50 MERS and there will be 50 of them that cover a particular nucleotide with with a shift by one nucleotide, right? So you have 50, 50 MERS that still span a particular nucleotide. And then you map them all back to the genome. Right, okay. And then you count how many of those 50 were uniquely mapped back to the same position. So it depends on how the reference genome has it. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't then you're mapping to the reference genome Yeah. But I think I think reference genome does contain CMBs, yeah, yeah. right? I think so it has that yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed to novel ones. Uh-huh. <coughs> so there are other considerations such as um, <coughs> material quality, degradation. Very often people are faced with the problem of profiling of uh, uh, archived material, such as uh, paraffin embedded and formal and fixed uh, specimens. And, um, and that kind of um, confounding factor also has to be taken into account through a certain uh, normalization and correction um, uh, procedures. So there are yet other biases to the next-gen sequencing profiling. Um, and that is not uniform distribution of reads along the transcript. So it seems that specifically for Illumina platform, the nucleotide frequency of the uh, individual reads is not uniform. So the very first few, the, the first um, dozen um, uh, nucleotides of any given read has a certain bias for nucleotide frequency. And that results in the uneven uh, distribution of reads along the transcript. Now, if you think of it, um, it will give you not a straight line, right, for the expression level of any given transcript. But it would be like peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, right? And so it is intrinsic to the microarray platform itself which is caused by the um, uh, probe affinity issue. 
So each and every probe on microarray does not necessarily give you absolutely equal signal in terms of magnitude. And so this is not a problem when you compare multiple samples. Y you just see the curve um, that um, is followed by pretty much all of the samples, and then you're fine. But when it, when it comes to the analysis of, say, differential splicing within a given sample or within a given gene in a given sample, then it may be a problem because you may have a lower signal for one axon and you may infer that this axon is um, underrepresented in the transcript pool of this particular sample and this is not necessarily the case. So. Um, People are actually uh, recognizing this problem, and again, they're trying to come up with a certain weighing scheme uh, to correct these biases. But so, so what I was trying to say is that both microarray and next-gen sequencing technology, they both have their own biases that still should be taken into consideration uh, for proper analysis. So, now, so here's a specific example. Uh, this is from my uh, current study of prostate cancer samples that have been profiled with next-gen sequencing, and these are FFPE samples. So, and I'm assessing the splicing profiling, sp splicing profiles of these um, samples. And this is a um, distribution of a certain splicing metric uh, for each and every sample. So I have 11 samples here, including a couple of cell lines. And now what I suddenly see is that for one of the samples, I have very unusual distribution. It looks weird. And so, and, and, and I knew that basically I did not have a problem of a um, variable sequencing depth. I did not have a um, uh, variation in my sample's nature. They were all FFPE, the same amount of material, the same quality of RNA. It was corrected for gene lengths and etc. So now, when I go back to the expression distributions, I, I see clearly that this particular sample, so, so this is a typical distribution for the RNA-seq data. For expression measures, this is the expression measure, and this is, and this is uh, distribution. So for this particular sample, I see that the fraction of, um, you know, modestly expressed species is much less compared to other samples. And this can mean the uh, greater degradation of this particular sample. And, you know, to me it did make sense because this sample was from the lymph node, and from the lymph node FFP, it's, it's a bit challenging to get a pretty good quality RNA insulation. So, now, this tells me that indeed I need a normalization step even for my pretty much, you know, um, equally distributed data uh, with regard to other factors. Just a question about the FFP samples. Do you have any uh, quality control um, metrics for the sample before you do the sequencing for these FFP samples to identify the highly degraded samples? Well, um, the first check is the check for the RNA isolation mm -hmm. itself. And then what we prefer to do, because we have a microarray facility, mm -hmm. we usually do a microarray profiling. Mm -hmm. And we see how the sample performs and how interesting it is to us. Because sequencing is still a way more expensive than microarrays. And because we have all that technology in-house, we can afford it. So we do the initial screening with microarrays and see the quality. Uh? The whole genome microarray or just the whole transcriptome, okay. the whole transcriptome. Yes, and then we see the quality and <coughs> and the expression profile. So if it, if you know, if it's really flat, then we just don't bother sequencing it. Mm -hmm. um, so and now, yes. Uh huh. Well, you can't really tell until you start doing something with it, right? In our experience, uh, we still can do more or less fine with samples up to 10 years old. 
If it's over 10 years old, the degradation is very significant and it's pretty hard to profile it. Well, yeah, so, so you, yeah, you take a look at the, basically at the schmear <laughs> that you have. <laughs> yeah, but, um, um, well, you can think of some, you know, p specific PCR, you know, on some of your interesting genes, but we're not interested in any specific genes, but we're rather interested in the whole transcriptome <laughs> profiling, and then you just, you just see, um, you know this the um, the spectrum of the fragment sizes that you have in your isolate you know it's, it's it's very indirect so you can't really tell upfront how well the profiling will go if you if you see you know a reasonable schmear in your gel then you just go ahead and analyze it mm -hmm. and then certainly microarrays is a, is a good check it's just it's expensive check it's yeah it's, it's yeah. expensive check but I mean three three hundred dollars versus pretty much yeah so about ten grand it's, so just a it's a bit of a difference <laughs> not, not to beat this to death but from experimental design you know if you're going to take samples of different quality and you start comparing it's a big issue a it's a big issue so and uh, and and uh, for instance in our institution we uh, uh, we're, we're also faced with the problem of comparing different formats of samples, fresh frozen versus FFB, and uh, this is not a simple batch effect, for sure. It's a, it's, it's a problem, and people are trying to come up with a certain algorithms that would uh, correct for these differences, so it, it's not simple. What is this FFP? This is a f uh, formalin, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Yes, it's a pathology sample, yeah. So, uh -huh. yeah. So the advantage of having FFP is that you can do a histology on that and pathology on that, on the entire block, and then you can micro dissect the tumor itself and uh, leave the benign tissue stroma, say, outside, right? And, and then you can take, the, say, this trauma and then do a comparative analysis to see the effect of the microenvironment and et cetera, and feel the effect of et cetera. Plus With fresh frozen, the quality of the RNA and DNA isolates is way higher, but at the same time, you never know the tumor content. You, you just, it's, it's pretty much like a black box. And fresh frozen, so it hasn't been the most traditional way of preserving. Yes. Samples. So yeah. the FFP samples there. Yeah, there most banks are full with FFPs. I've seen estimates of millions of FFP samples that have been Yeah. yeah. And very often for certain cancer types, there is also another challenge of a um, availability of only a small amount of material. For prostate cancer, for instance, prostate cancer volume is. It's very early detected, and the, the tumor volume is really tiny. And so we are posed with two challenges here, FFP in prostate cancer and small amount. OK. So you, you microdisect by Oh. You know, this is, this is a hard question. Um, Let's say, um, in, in terms of cells, I can't give you the number, but in terms of the FFP homogeneity, it would be something like um, a couple of hundred microliters. How many micrograms are there? It should be on the order of a microgram. Is that right? Is that right about a microgram? Yeah, it depends. It depends, but on average, um, 
for any given assay that you're doing, you have pretty much about one microgram of total RNA. Okay, so Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, and now it is clear that for the next-gen sequencing technology, when it comes to the analysis of multiple samples, we still need to go through the same pipeline, which includes this um, set of steps. So um, these are three familiar steps from microarray analysis which are preceded by the mapping of the RNA-seq data onto the um, feature sequence database. So here, in this case, we have a feature sequence database, and feature being genes or transcripts or axons and junctions, um, as you wish. It can be any database of your choice, depending on what study you're doing. And then you have a, you have your library and reads coming out from the Illumina sequencer, and so you map it onto this feature sequence database, and you get your read counts. So the um, this is done using different algorithms, Mac and Bowtie, are popular ones. Um, then you still need to do the mappability and background correction. So how we do the background correction, for instance, we. Uh, we take a look at the distribution of uh, read counts in intronic regions and intergenic regions. And we take that distribution as our background level for a given library. Um, and then we do a summarization. So it is basically the same what, what, what kind of expression measurements you want to get. Axon wise, or transcript-wise or gene-wise. So it is just a matter of summarization and it's uh, dependent on your feature sequence database. And then you do a normalization, as I mentioned to you before. So uh, the RPKM is one simple uh, global normalization method, which is just simply dividing by a single value per library. And uh, in, in the paper that I showed you uh, in the beginning from 2010, it seems that this kind of global normalization is not quite adequate because it is very much affected and driven by a minority of genes that um, uh, represent the majority of the reads population. So some 5% of human genes give you 50% of reads. And so that's why this kind of global normalization introduce, introduces a bias. And so what, what rather people do now is they do something similar to the microarray normalization, and that would be something like an upper quartile normalization that seems to be quite appropriate, and those, that group show that it's quite adequate. And in the end, you get the same log two expression measurements, which are directly comparable with your microarrays experiments. So now, what I've been telling you so far with regard to the next-gen sequencing um, regards the, um, the prerequisite of a feature database, feature sequence database. So the a priori coding content of the human genome that you need to have. But now, uh, the uh, next-gen sequencing technology provides much more than that. So basically you can use next-gen sequencing to reconstruct transcriptome and genome de novo using paradigm sequences. And, and this is a um, highly, um, um, you know, novel and um, actively developing field. And these are just a couple of recent papers that I can refer you to uh, that have developed algorithms for reconstruction of transcriptomes de novo. I'm not going to touch that. It's it's a bit uh, advanced topic, and it's it's not really relevant to here um, to the course here. So, but you're welcome to take a look at that. Okay, so this was the first part of the first part. <laughs> Now I'm moving on to the illustration of application of these technologies 
to the profiling of expression and in particular um, splice variants, alternative splicing, uh, with the illustration of um, uh, splicing um, uh, repertoire profiling in breast and prostate cancers. So before I, before I do that, I will give you a very short introduction just as a refresher for you what the alternative splicing is. So it's uh, ubiquitous in the genome. So um, probably almost 100% of all of the human genes undergo alternative splicing in tissue and condition specific matter. And of course, it is very, um, it is very uh, mobile system and of course it's implicated in in human disease including cancer. Did you raise your hand? Yes. So, um, a question about that uh, first statement. That was about. Yes. That's if you consider all tissues at all times, right? Yes. So for any given yes. tissue at any given time, you may only have one or two alternative, I mean you can have many. That's an excellent question. So let me ask you then the following question here. Yeah. It's relevant. See, this is an expression distribution for all of the transcripts in the human genome for prostate cancers. One tissue type. Well, well no. No. You see that they, these samples pretty much follow the same bimodal distribution. Why is it bimodal? Yes. Why? What are these two different distributions? Incompletely spliced. Uh, close. HNRNA. Close, and it's very close related to your question. So, in any given cell, in any given tissue, in any given condition, not all of the genes and not all of the transcripts are expressed. So, in my experience, only about two thirds of all of the transcripts are expressed in any given cell. So, and this fraction is not expressed um, features. Axons and junctions and ultimately transcript variants. So this fraction of transcripts are expressed at certain level. Log 2 of 5 is very reasonable expression. And then this is basically a background. So yes, it is this number comes from the comparison of multiple tissues and multiple conditions, but mostly multiple tissues. Yeah. Well, that graph you showed us, you could tell that the same proportion of genes would be expressed and not expressed. Mm -hmm. but I guess for more the underlying sequence data, you can tell that it's the same subset of genes that are being expressed. That would be a very interesting question to ask. I didn't ask this qu that question, but I would assume that in this particular set, because this is a pretty much homogeneous set, it's a prostate cancer, it's a prostate epithelial cells, so I would I would expect to have a great overlap between samples in terms of which genes express and which ones are not. Okay, so alternative splicing is tightly regulated uh, process. And um, it involves a um, number of um, um, cis uh, regulators and trans regulators. And trans regulators being a spliceosome, which is a huge um, um, ribonuclear protein complex composed of some 200 different proteins and uh, RNAs. Um, these are different factors, um, uh, parts of spliceosome. And cis regulatory uh, sequences are the um, RNA sequences, uh, signals, the splicing signals. So one of them, um, say the splice size five prime, three prime splice size, branch size, and then intronic splicing enhancers and silencers, and exonic splicing enhancers and uh, uh, silencers. So this is a very tightly uh, regulated process and very finely regulated process. And you can imagine that any aberration that, that uh, takes place either within cis uh, regulators or trans regulators can lead to the alteration of splicing patterns. And that can result in the deregulation of cellular processes such as death, fertility, invasion, differentiation, and proliferation. So 
Um, are there any examples of uh, cancer-specific splice isoforms? And the answer is yes. There is a, uh, uh, a great number of different examples. So just to show you a few, uh, this is a simplest scenario where you have only one cassette axon. This is called a cassette axon when you have just one internal alternative of axon. It's called cassette axon, which can produce the short isoform and long isoform. And for these forms, um, we have an example of FGFR1 that has cancer-specific isoform that lacks uh, the alternative axon. And it's co uh, correlated with poor prognosis in breast cancer and uh, malignancy of astrocytomas. Now, the inclusion of cancer-specific isoform um, um, so the, the, the short isoform, again, in WISP-1 and VEGF, where you see that cancer-specific short isoform for WISP-1 has different biological properties compared to the normal um, inclusion isoform. It causes cells to invade. Another example is VEGF, where you have a cancer-specific short isoform uh, lacking the functional domain of the protein. And now, uh, one of the notorious examples is the BCLX gene, which has long and short isoforms. And the long isoform is anti apoptotic cancer isoform, and short isoform is the apoptosis promoting form. Uh, so, uh, there are other examples of splicing. Splicing can be very complex, and uh, this is probably one of the ultimate examples of uh, a number of tandem alternative axons, some maybe 10 axons, that can be spliced in different numbers and different combinations to give a really um, uh, big spectrum of um, isoforms. And there are examples of such genes, for instance, Tennyson C, which has a eight kilobases um, uh, alternative region uh, in the in the middle of the gene uh, and that isoform facilitates cell migration uh, by inducing loss of adhesion and um, basically um, it, it's present at much higher levels in invasive breast cancers uh, compared to the non-invasive breast cancers and antibody has been raised against this alternative region to detect glioblastomas in brain tissue CD44 is another notorious gene for very complex alternative splicing. Um, it has 10 alternative axons. They are spliced in different combinations, and there was a precedent of using antibody against a specific alternative axon within that gene um, against the um, splice variant V6 unfortunate for head and neck carcinoma. Unfortunately, it didn't go really far um, because of the high toxicity of that antibody. But still, so um, why, why do we care about splicing itself, in particular with regard to the uh, clinical applications? So if you have a gene model like that with a, an alternative region in the middle, you can have two transcript isoforms excluding and including the alternative axon. And so you can imagine that um, two protein isoforms are translated from these transcript isoforms. And if you raise an antibody against the common part between these protein isoforms, um, and then if it, if it turns out that one of the isoforms plays um, a um, cancer beneficial role compared to the normal isoform, then you would be shutting down, say, if this is a therapeutic um, agent, your antibody, right? Then it would block the function of both isoforms and you would have a toxicity for normal cells that express normal isoform. Uh, so this is a scenario where the protein is, say, on the cell surface. Now, if you imagine raising an antibody against only the alternative region, then you can specifically target the cancer-specific protein isoform and spare normal isoform, which can be very beneficial for normal functioning of the cell. And thus, you reduce the toxicity of a uh, new therapy. And so, all this knowledge can be used effectively in clinical applications. Now, 
how do we interrogate alternative splicing on the whole transcriptome level? There are two ways, using microarrays and next-gen sequencing technology. So using microarrays, um, it is a matter of choosing a subgene level microarray platform that has multiple probes per gene, say, for each and every axon, you have a probe. There are specific platforms, um, microarray platforms, um, that are more effective in terms of the design. They would include junction sequences between uh, corresponding axons. So in these junction sequences would come from the transcript variants that have been observed somewhere and are annotated in the database. So um, the example of such platform, which would be called splice sensitive, or junction array is the Affymetrix Research Human Junction Array. Uh, and so you see in the summary below that it has some half a million features and it um, interrogates 250,000 axons in the human genome, which uh, represents 33,000 transcripts. And you have this number of exonic probes and this number of junction probes. Yes. So you have multiple probes per gene, and you have a probes for axons, BSRs, they called. So, and then you have probes for junctions between them. So junctions would be highly specific. So you can imagine that if you have only axonic probes, and you have a pool of different isoforms in any given sample, then it would be really hard for you to infer the transcript structure just from the, um, from the expression level of each and every axon. You do not know which axon is connected to which. So that's why I personally prefer uh, platforms that have junction probes. They provide additional information uh, to the inference of the transcript structures. Is it the same level? Exactly. So, yes. So the right panel shows um, a similar idea behind um, profiling splicing using next gen sequencing. So you have your feature database, sequence database, that is comprised of exonic regions and junctions. And then you map uh, RNA secretes onto that feature database. You do all of the normalization background correction steps, as I described before and you get a profile similar to these microarrays. And so, as I mentioned to you, this, is, this all is based on the prior annotation of the human genome. You have to know which, which axons you are interrogating. You have to have sequence for them. You have to have sequences for junctions. And this is one of the examples of such a database that has been created um, in Vancouver in Genome Sciences Center by Mark Amara uh, Group where they have much more features represented compared to, say, microarrays. It's much more comprehensive database. They tried, they made an attempt to represent not all known junctions, but also all possible junctions in the human genome, uh, which uh, resulted in this huge increase from 300,000 uh, to 1.2 million different junctions. Yes. Uh, for each sample, uh, is there possible uh, uh, multiple uh, only one type, right? You, got, you invented uh, multiple uh, probes for different types, and for each sample, they only possible have one type, right? I mean, you uh, What do you mean by one type? Uh, alternative, uh, you've got alternative splicing, mm -hmm. the possibility of routing different types. Then you, uh, for each different types, you uh, uh, designed a probe for that. Then for each sample, they only could have one specific uh, Of course. So it can happen that within any given sample, only one isoform is expressed. That and then get multiple of them in one sample? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it's rare. You know, as I mentioned to you, um, the, the rate of alternative splicing in human genome is high. Now, if you're dealing with a specific um, tissue, 
uh, use PCR to replicate one specific type of a lot of uh, corporates, right? So when you approve for expre uh, expression uh, for that one, it's only uh, specific for one type, right? I mean for one... So maybe this one will explain uh, the, the question? Uh, answer, yeah. maybe this one will variant answer your question? One. Yeah, for each sample, they only could possibly have uh, one variant. One transfer variant. Yes, it is possible. And but but uh, more it's often... It's possible to have uh, two variants. And it's more often. It's more often that for uh, any given gene, um, especially uh, for the gene that is of, you know, um, cancer interest, it happens much more often that there is a uh, number of uh, distinct splice isoforms that are expressed at a certain ratio in any given sample. Now, when you say all possible junctions, so could you could you review that again? It's not all yeah. possible junctions in trans, right? It's all possible junctions in cis within an existing transcript. You know, yes, you know within a given gene. Yes, certainly. So. One with two, one with three, one with four. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 A million two seems seems a small number for all possible. Yeah, you know, so like if you... BCR able, mm -hmm. I'm sure BCR able is in there, but yeah. you know, that's a special case. So there's yeah. roughly 200,000 axons in the human okay. genome, right? And yeah. so if you imagine all possible combinations, that would be two to the power of that. It's, it's a daunting number. And so, but in principle, you know, if at some point, you know, the, the, uh, the computer capacity will match those mm -hmm. tasks in the future, it will be possible to search for fusions, for instance, yeah. in this uh, matter. So, um, and could you review the difference between a PSR and an exon? So, it, consider it's about the same. Okay. So, the exon region is PSR. It's a probe selection region, what it's called. Yeah. Uh, analysis but it's bored, I'm sorry, but it's bored from microarrays. So, it's used mostly in microarrays field. Mm -hmm. in, in next gen field, um, it would be called a feature. Well, in the analysis, you have to treat it as a group, right? You cannot treat it as a, a process as usual. You have to take account, account of all the variants. You, a bunch of uh, 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 different probes for the different variants, but you, when you analysis, you try to treat it as one group, right? For uh, inferring for alternative splicing? For uh, splicing, yeah. For differential splicing, yes. So um, the the way the algorithm goes, at least um, uh, at least the one that I've developed, um, it uh, it takes into consideration um, all of the probes within a given gene, within a given gene. So all of the transcripts, and um, it looks at the profile of expression for each and every feature across samples. Then it does a certain normalization procedure that takes uh, out the differential gene expression and then I'm, uh, I'm left with a differential axon expression which is an indication of splicing. Sorry, I don't have that particular slide. I didn't really think that it would be of interest to you but I can show you during the break if you, if you wish um, how it's, it can be done. Yeah, and so this slide uh, summarizes uh, the strategy for uh, inferring, in, inferring differential splicing from next-gen sequencing. So you have your gene model uh, in the top with the alternative axon 2, which is included in splice variant 1, but it's excluded in splice variant 2. And then we have reads that are mapped to unique junctions in this case, these junctions are unique and distinct from from these junctions. That's how you can um, tell these two splice isoforms apart. And then if, if you catalog all of the observed axons and all possible junctions, um, maybe if you wish, do 2 to the power of 200,000 as you wish, and then you map your RNA-seq um, uh, reads onto this feature database and that's how you get the expression level and ratio of splice variants for all human genes in a given sample. 
So and now, actually, yes. Before you go to this slide. And then, uh, what about uh, care dams? And uh, the ability to sort of spend larger sort of Exxon boundaries? Well, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in this kind of design, I don't usually use the paired-in information, so it's it's kind of unpaired. Yeah. So the paired and um, yeah, you can use it basically for fusion detections and breakpoints detections for sure. But uh, this would be a slightly different algorithm. Yes, for sure. And that's and that's what they do. They use this information in the reconstruction de novo. Yeah. So that that is crucial for those kind of algorithms. But this is kind of simple, and so it does not really require the paradigm information. Okay. So. This slide shows a uh, molecular profiling of, uh, of subtypes of breast cancer using microarrays, and that was a splice-sensitive uh, microarray platform. Um, this was a study that um, I was doing uh, back in California in LDNL, and uh, it was recently published uh, in molecular cancer research. So. So in breast cancer, we have a number of subtypes, which are called ERBI-2 bays and luminal A and luminal Bs, which show um, a different survival experience. And um, we know that these subtypes are uh, very well defined through the expression profiles. So they very much differ in terms of expression profiles from each other. And now this is a splicing pattern. This is not a gene expression. This is a splicing pattern, splicing profiling of the same, uh, of the same uh, breast cancer cell lines. And what we saw there is that each and every subtype of breast cancer had a specific splice signature. It was, uh, the, the it was a unsupervised clustering, and um, um, we did not find any new um, a splicing pattern subgroups. Um, the splicing repertoire pretty much followed the, the expression-derived um, subtypes. But it was good to see that these subtypes also differed in splicing patterns. But also what was interesting to see is that alternatively, or differentially rather, spliced genes across the breast cancer subtypes had zero overlap with the differentially expressed genes in the same cell lines. So there was zero overlap between differentially expressed genes and alternatively spliced genes in the same cells. And uh, this is a result of a pathway enrichment analysis where you see um, the enrichment with alternatively spliced genes in red and enrichment with differentially expressed genes in blue. So you can see that different pathways are enriched with alternatively spliced genes compared to the uh, differentially expressed genes. So for the splicing, you would see axonal guidance signaling, afferent receptor signaling, integrin signaling, and actin cytoskeleton signaling, which was pretty much in line with, with the underlying um, mor mor morphological and uh, uh, differences and phenotypic differences of our breast cancer subtypes because some of the subtypes are much more aggressive and invasive um, potential is much higher compared to the other subtypes. So that was, yes. So, so should, should you not have five of those intrinsic subtypes for each one of your, um, your signaling pathways? Say it again, please. So do, you, do you need to stratify those pathways with each subtype? Or no, I don't need to because what I'm looking what I'm looking at it, it's just it, it's um, so when you compare say two subgroups and you want to get a certain insight into the biology that drives these differences. So what you do is you look you look for a differentially expressed genes or splice variants in between these two groups. And then and then you do the enrichment 
the um, geo enrichment analysis or pathway enrichment analysis. And then you suddenly see that a certain pathway is enriched with the differentially expressed genes between these two groups. And that's how you can infer that this pathway may be important in, um, uh, in you know, shaping up the differences between these two subgroups so of your samples. And that's what is done here. So is that, is that, that would be different within each subgroup? Yeah, I see what you're asking. So, um, so um, in I that study... So if you if you take a the the entire set of my samples, breast cancer cell lines, yeah. and you look for differentially expressed genes across all of them, you get a list yeah, of good. yeah, and and you take top yeah. top with the greatest variance across samples. This is your list of differentially expressed genes. Now you do the same with uh, with differential splicing. You look for splicing differences, different rate of inclusion or exclusion of any particular uh, axon across the same samples. So you're looking at the differences so that there would be two splice variants for any given gene in this one, in, in this in these samples. So I yes, in a similar scenario. Yeah. Yeah. And so say for yeah, for this particular axon. These are all cell lines. So that's and so you do the same thing, and you get the, yeah, the same top yeah. list of mostly yeah. variable yeah. axons. Yeah. And then you compare the genes. Are they the same? No. And this indicates, this suggests that transcriptional regulation acts in parallel with the alternative splicing regulation of the uh, gene expression. Yeah. That's what this yes. And so w w what these arrows actually tells you, this is actually very informative for others in terms of how to go about the study design, for instance, right? So if you are, say, come to the microarray facility and you say, okay, you know what? I'm working with breast cancer and I am very much interested in the Ephraim receptor signaling pathway genes. So what platform would you recommend me to use for profiling my samples? And the answer would be splice sensitive, because it seems that this pathway is very much regulated by splicing rather than by differential expression, and vice versa. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's epigenetic. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> yeah, and um, so... Um, uh, it actually yes. does suggest that it might be a good idea to develop new metrics as well. Not that bioinformatics needs more metrics. Well, it does and it doesn't. <laughs> but to, you know, the relative proportion of pathology contributed to a process by each of these levels of regulation. So the, the proportion of metabolic badness that's happening because of alternative splicing compared to the proportion of metabolic badness due to differential expression, which is mm -hmm. likely what would arise from epigenetic changes. Of mm -hmm. Certain genes being relatively upregulated or downregulated versus the proportion of, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, differences from normal homeostasis that's happening because of yeah. Point mutations or other types of variants. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually a very good point. Uh, the, control here? the control here, well, the control here was um, normal. Well, HMEX. Yeah. Um, the unfortunately, th there was a flaw in the design uh, because of the lack of you know normal memory tissues, and so. Um, yeah. So the the goal in that study was to look at the differences between between subtypes, and, and certainly it can reflect the uh, differences in the origin of these subtypes of cancers, for sure. So you can't really, yeah, say that these are, you know, particularly cancer-specific. This can be specific to the uh, cells of origin. And, and now th this is actually a very good point that you brought up. Uh, so, you know, my belief is, is that really, um, you know, for different diseases, for different cancer types, 
it may be uh, it may be a specific mechanism of regulation that plays a major role. So, for instance, in breast cancer, what I was seeing is that there is a great deal of both transcriptional regulation and splicing regulation between subtypes. Now, when I'm looking at prostate cancer right now. It seems that splicing plays a much bigger role than differentially uh, than than transcriptional regulation. And in the recent uh, paper uh, from the MSKCC uh, by Charles Soares on uh, integration of um, uh, you know high resolution data for prostate cancer, it was it was clear that, for instance, mutations in 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 oncogenes and uh, do not play a big role in prostate cancer. So they are very rare compared to other cancer types. So, yeah, it seems that for any given subject of your interest, it may be a specific um, uh, mechanism that plays a major role. Well, that's at least, you know, my opinion. <laughs> so is it, is it time for a Faustian bargain with the cosmetic surgeons in Hollywood where you could get lots of breast tissue from otherwise healthy women? <sighs> and then, then you'd know the actual splicing patterns of your, your control <laughs> tissue where, where, where it was not being done for some other pathology. Most people don't like to spare healthy tissue. Exactly. Especially from that organ. Or are you walk around 50 of them in Toronto every day for reduction of the plastic? The thing we had this common discussion about collecting normal pancreas. The solution was to drive around with a cylinder of liquid nitrogen and look for a bicycle accidents. <laughs> <laughs> so that, because that tissue would be great, like the second you all die, so you have to jump in. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the same problem for prostate yeah. cancer, where normal samples would normally come from African Americans. Yeah. It would lead a certain lifestyle. But I thought that there was an issue with all this work in that when you have a solid, solid tumor, you're talking contaminated with normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a separate issue. But is it a separate Whatever. issue? Okay. Is there there that it's using the normal tissue? Yeah. Okay, no. no. You, you can't really. The adjacent, the adjacent uh, normal tissue, which is more or less benign by the pathology, you can't really. Um, call it normal normal because of the tumor microenvironment interaction nobody knows these days how far tumor cells actually travel uh, through the uh, microenvironment it can be actually very far and this is a separate um, uh, you know field of research uh, in prostate in particular because it's a in prostate it's it's a multifocal disease so it can happen in, in multiple foci in, in the prostate itself. And so it's it's very important issue. And yeah. getting I mean getting control neutral, never mind transcriptome, which is very complicated you can actually have control, but even genomic control so normal DNA so non cancerous tissue would be think would be not easy to get. But so for, for pancreas we use blood uh -huh. to get our normal DNA. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The same CTCs. And we'll be there. It's a tough problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And for splicing, it's a huge issue. So, for instance, there are a great number of differences in splicing between cells grown in 2D and 3D, even. So it's it's very very mobile system. Okay, so um, this was a very interesting discussion. Thank you for that. Uh, um, so this slide just shows um, another example of uh, um, benefits of profiling splicing. Um, in cancer, this is a paper published in Bioinformatics in 2006, where they profiled a number of FFP uh, samples from prostate cancer, and um, they had uh, uh, normals and uh, uh, cancers, and uh, um, the goal was to build a classifier 
to um, stratify um, normals and cancer samples. And based on the 128 isoform specific classifiers, they were able to reach accuracy of 92%, whereas using the gene expression classifiers, um, they achieved a accuracy which was 5% less. It's not, it doesn't seem to be much, but still it is an improvement. So um, it does seem to bring in an additional knowledge and additional power into the uh, tumor classification problem. Now, this is an example um, from my current study that I am uh, leading at the Vancouver Prostate Center on um, profiling prostate cancer patients of high risk using next-gen sequencing technology. This is a brand new data. Uh, you see that there's only a few samples there, but this is just an illustration that using next-gen sequencing technology, we can do the same thing and profile in high-resolution manner alternative splicing profiles of tumor samples. So uh, there were just a few, one, two, three, four, five, six samples there, including two prostate cancer cell lines. And on the left, you see the, um, uh, the unsupervised hierarchical clustering of gene expression profiling. And on the right, you see the, cl the clustering of differentially spliced genes in the same samples. So from the first glance, what you see is that the clustering is you know, significantly different. There was a much tighter clustering of the splicing profiles compared to the gene expression profiles. And then again, I saw very little overlap between differentially spliced genes and uh, differentially expressed genes. And so this again suggested to me, um, very similar to the breast cancer case, um, that transcription regulation and splicing regulation mechanisms act in parallel to modulate cell processes in prostate cancer progression. Do you, does one of those two approaches correlate more closely with a histological or clinical classification of disease? Well, th that's so. That's a very interesting question here. So, so what you see here? Let's just take a look. I don't know yet. This is a ongoing study right now, and this is what I'm interested in answering. So, from the first glance, what I see here is I have two cell lines that are pretty much a derivatives of each other. They differ in, um, in certain aspects, but one of them is parental, another one is a subline. Now, what else I have is a one patient with primary disease and leaf node. In expression, they cluster together, and these cell lines also cluster together. I also the had a second, I'm um, sorry? Are not the same no, no, no. These are established cell lines that have been around for, I don't know, more than a decade. Um, now, uh, now um, so this is one patient. So here's another patient, which is a very interesting case. Um, he had a metastatic disease, and he had two sites of metastasis. He had a ure uh, urethral metastasis, which are quite often in prostate cancer, but also he had a penile metastasis. And these histologically looked very different from the uh, from the usual urethral metastasis, and yet the uh, the expression profiles uh, showed a that these two samples clustered together. Now, if I look at the at the splicing profiling, what I see is that now my urethral metastasis sample clusters together with the cell lines and the penile metastasis clusters together with the primary and lymph node of a different patient. Now, I cannot explain right now whether it is sensible because I have very few samples and uh, my goal is to answer this particular question. Um, what is to shed light into how much effect does this splicing regulation have in the metastasis process in prostate cancer into urethra and into the penile? But I must tell you that the um, that the genes that were 
um, differentially spliced between uh, different types of metastasis and they corresponding primary tumors were completely different and they were very much related to the um, organ of metastasis which is good um, when you were referring to uh, uh, urethral metastases, uh, or, uh, did you mean direct extension of the tumor to the urethra or distant metastases? So urethra is very close to the prostate right. itself. So what happens very often during surgery, um, they, they do the transurethral resection of prostate, which is called TERP. And when they do this, there may be a, um, you know, um, a residual disease left in that particular spot. And it is thought in, um, uh, you know, by clinicians that those remnants of that tissue may give rise to a um, urethral metastasis. So, in, you know, from, from one um, standpoint, it can be considered a sort of a local disease because it's very, urethra is very close to prostate. But from the other hand, um, um, I'm sorry, um, the, uh, the urethra uh, met can be classified as slightly different tumor. Sometimes they call it a bladder tumor. So they just characterize it as a bladder tumor. It is still a question whether there is indeed still a prostate tumor that keeps growing there, or whether it is, you know, a different origin for that tumor. Say, because so, because of the wound healing uh, processes that um, take place there, a certain pathways get turned on, and then you get a, a you know, a malignant transformation in that particular site. So it is still an open question. But uh, at this point, the urethral metastases are considered to be a distant metastasis. So it's not the same organ anymore. It's, it's, it, it's complicated. It's complicated, especially in prostate cancer. There is a number of surgical procedures that they do on patients, and uh, there is a lot of, you know, um, uh, definitions that differ from clinician to clinician, from center to center. It's, it's a bit complicated. No. So how do you, what, is, what do those colors represent? So this represents differences between the samples themselves that are within within that dendrogram. Okay, so it, it could just be that, that one of those targets is always undergoes a lot of... Yes, um, it can be. So you can't you can infer a cancer-specific splicing here. You can infer okay. the, uh, you know, the tumor sample. Uh, uh, specific, right? Either metastasis or primary tumor specific splicing. But you're absolutely right, and that's what we're doing right now. We were able to uh, uh, to get hold of the uh, normal tissue, which is, you know, a uh, cell cell line of a finite lifespan that was established from a completely normal and healthy young male, which is as normal as it can get in prostate field. Is that a, sort of a measure of the proportion of transcript that has a alternative splice in the vent? So the red would be, I guess red is high, so red would be the, the, a greater proportion of that transcript undergoes a transcript splice? Because or this is, is it, no, it, you can't really tell this or out or of this, it. unfortunately. Um, it, uh, the, the kind of inference that you're trying to make right now requires an additional step of reconstruction of transcript structures. What this is, rather, is just a feature-based signal. So, yes, red is up and green is down, right? And so what it can say is that, say, this junction is up in this group. Okay. But this may be a junction which is specific to the skip of the alternative axon. 
So, so um, this is this is uh, this is what um, I'm working on right now in collaboration with the uh, SFU group um, uh, from uh, Computer Sciences Department. They're trying to reconstruct the transcript structure from this data. So those aren't actually genes; they're just locations. These are features. Features within. Okay. Yes. <coughs> okay, um, so I, I think uh, we're going to take a short break, uh, um, and then we will um, continue with the part two of module three. <coughs>